Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue our discussion of rendering by talking about the ray tracing algorithm. This is essentially just an extension of the ray casting algorithm that we already have been discussing, but now in ray tracing we're going to allow ourselves to launch secondary rays into the universe to capture effects like reflection, transparency, and so on. So let's start with a bit of review. So in the last couple lectures, by talking about how to intersect rays with different types of objects out there in the world, essentially we've been trying to make our ray casting algorithm more flexible and to handle a broader class of objects. Remember the basic structure of ray casting is shown on the slide here. What we do is we have an outer loop over all the pixels in our image. And for each pixel, we construct a ray from the eye into the world. And now our job is to figure out the first object that that ray runs into, right? We're sort of tracing rays backward from your eye to the light bulb. I suppose this is like physics run in reverse. Uh, so we iterate over every object in the scene, compute the closest intersection, and or rather compute whether it intersects and the T value at which it does. And if it's closer than the closest intersection, we keep it. And finally, we shade the pixel given the uh, closest one. Probably we should put the shading computation out here. Uh, there's no reason to shade something if we can't see it. Uh, in any event, the, uh, the ray casting algorithm is nice, but it doesn't capture many of the effects that we see in the world where rays are sort of gathered from secondary sources. It's not just a direct path from the light bulb to the object to your eye, but rather maybe it makes some stops through different reflective surfaces, maybe passing through a window with some refraction and so on. And so those are the sorts of effects that we're going to talk about how to capture today. So earlier, we've already talked about many of the ingredients that go into ray casting and ray tra tracing. That includes, you know, how to define different types of cameras, how to represent a ray, uh, and how to intersect rays with different pieces of geometry. Essentially, our goal today is to put a wrapper around all of this material and use it more than once. Essentially what we're going to see is that if you write a piece of code that takes in two things, a description of your scene and a ray, and outputs what that ray runs into first, that piece of code can be reused and reused and reused to capture all kinds of cool rendering effects. So essentially what our ray tracer is going to do is just keep calling this ray scene intersection code uh, to make the quality of our scene better, anti-alias the pixels, um, even capture different effects like glossy reflection and so on, where the rays kind of scatter at the same time as uh, reflection. And all of these things, the really amazing thing about it is that they don't require that much additional code, that just by encapsulating and writing the pieces of code in our ray tracer very carefully, it's very easy to extend and capture all kinds of fun and interesting physical effects. So as some examples, in today's lecture, we'll talk about a few effects that are quite easy to capture in the ray tracing setup. This includes shadows, where essentially an object is just blocking the light, reflections, and refractions, where an object is redirecting light. What we'll see in today's lecture is that all three of these effects are just a few extra lines of code in a ray tracer. But then the kind of funny thing is, in a while, in 6837, we're going to talk about real-time rendering, and we'll see that each of these effects is extremely difficult, well, extremely is a little strong, but quite difficult to capture in the real-time rendering environment. So these are really going to be the showpieces for why we should use ray tracing for certain types of realistic graphics when timing isn't as big of a consideration. The two effects that we're not going to talk about today, but we will eventually in this course, are indirect illumination, so this would be like light bouncing off of the red wall and then making a slight red hue on the floor. Uh, and caustics. So caustics would be like using the uh, glass object as a lens to uh, really sharpen the light on the bottom. We'll see that these are going to be a little bit more difficult to capture in the basic ray tracing setup because they involve rays that don't just bounce one time but kind of scatter or the rays are essentially required to trace backward to the light in a nonlinear and kind of difficult way. 
Uh, remember that ray casting and ray tracing, they're not simulating physics in the sense that f I think we would all agree that in physics, the photons go from the light to your eyeball. But in ray tracing and ray casting, we're going to trace from your eyeball back to the light. Now, there's an easy reason why that's the case, and that's that most photons don't actually reach your eye, right? So if you simulate the actual physics in the scene, you'll probably get a pretty low quality image. Although we'll see that our global illumination methods will essentially do exactly that. But uh, for some of these effects where light takes an extremely nonlinear path, we'll see that that's actually necessary. Okay, so in today's lecture, we're gonna talk about a few different effects. We'll talk about shadows, reflection, and refraction. Those are what's li listed at the top of the slide. And then we'll conclude by just a general discussion of recursive ray tracing with the basic effect that I think many of us have in mind when we think about recursive ray tracing is a hall of mirrors, you know? So maybe I have my eyeball is here, and then there's all kinds of mirrors that are oops, uh, redirecting the light in different directions. You know, some structure like that where the light maybe bounces in some weird path. I'm obviously not drawing this very well, but we're going to see that a recursive algorithm can capture this effect by essentially ray tracing from your eye to the first thing it sees, then from the reflected ray to the next thing, and so on. Of course, we have to be careful to combat infinite recursion or more likely just a lot of recursion. <laughs> so we may put a depth limit on this particular procedure. So let's get started. In particular, let's talk about how to add shadows to our ray traced scene. Now we've already discussed this or at least alluded to it a little bit in previous lectures, but now we'll do it in some more detail. So here on the slide, I've given you the basic algorithm for ray casting again. And the question is how could we modify it in a way to detect whether I should really shade an object or not. Well, let's think about what goes wrong in the basic ray casting algorithm, right? So in ray casting, we send out a ray from our eye and we find the first object that that ray runs into. And now the next line of code, again, should probably back, be back here, um, simply shades the pixel. And so how do we shade the pixel? Well, we already talked about how to do Lambertian shading or diffuse shading which essentially looks at the normal vector to the surface, looks it to the vector to the uh, light source, takes their dot product and uses that for the shading computation. But what doesn't this computation take into account? Well, if we think about it, we never actually checked that there exists a path from the light source to the surface that's getting lit. So that's to say that there's a line segment from the intersection point to the light source. And if there's some other object sitting in between, essentially obstructing the light, then we shouldn't shade this uh, particular object using that light source. Now, incidentally, there may be more than one light source, so we'll have to check each one independently. Um, but that's the basic idea of figuring out shadows in your ray tracer is to say, well, we can keep our basic code, but before we shade, we should make sure that we actually receive light from that light source. And how can we do that? Well, it's just a question of sending another ray out into the universe, right? In particular, I can start at our surface and I'm gonna launch a new ray, just like I had a ray coming out of my eye, but now I'm gonna make a ray that starts at the surface and heads toward the light source. And well, at some point, that ray runs into the light source. We can figure out the T value at which it does. If there's a smaller T where the ray from the object to the light source runs into another object, well, then you don't actually receive that light. So I think this is pretty straightforward logic and it's essentially all that we have to do to add shadows to our ray trace scene. So here's some kind of sort of pseudocode, sort of C++ uh, on the slide here. So here's how we can do it. Essentially, in that line of code where we shade, right, that's what's here, we need to figure out how to shade, and here's how we can do it. We can iterate over every light in the scene. And now for each light, we're going to make a new ray. So that ray has its source point at the hit point, right, the location 
where uh, the ray from your eye hits the first object. But now the direction is the direction to the light source. That's extremely simple, right? So it could be just the difference between the position of the light source and the position of the hit point, assuming that there's essentially just a point light source. And now uh, what do we do? We send that ray out into our ray trace scene and we figure out what it runs into. Uh, and so that's what's uh, going on here. And finally, we have an if statement that says, if that ray hits the light as the very first thing that it runs into, then I should shade. But if it runs into something else, some other object in between the uh, hit point and the light, then I shouldn't shade using that light. This is extremely simple logic. So essentially, our previous ray caster just jumped directly to the shading line of code. Now we're just making sure that we actually should get shaded by checking to make sure that there's not some object that's obscuring the light source uh, before it gets to the surface. That's it. So before we move on, uh, I should mention that there's one common source of bugs or artifacts in shadowed uh, code. This is something that almost certainly will come up in your ray tracing homework assignment. And that is a problem called self shadowing. So take a look at the images at the bottom of this slide here. Hopefully they'll go through on uh, our pre-recorded video. Now, let's say that we're ray tracing in a really simple universe. So all we know how to do is diffuse shading in shadows. Um, and we want to render a sphere that's casting a shadow underneath it. Now on the right hand side is what we probably would expect to happen, right? We have a nicely shaded diffuse sphere and moreover, there's a nice uh, circular-ish uh, shadow sitting underneath it. But in practice, maybe when we run our code for ray tracing, like what we saw on the previous slide, that's not actually what we observe. What we observe is the image on the left. So this is a good exercise for us to step back 10 feet and think about what went wrong. Why would I get these like weird salt and pepper artifacts where randomly some pixels look like they're black, other ones got shaded correctly? So here's the basic issue. So remember how our shadowing code works. So we have, um, maybe I'll try and draw a picture on the left hand side. Here's our sphere. Here's our eye. And here's the light source. So what do we do in the uh, ray tracing algorithm? We send out a ray from our eye and we say, aha, that ray runs into the sphere. So I should shade it. And now in our shadowing code, we make a new ray that points from the eye toward the light source, right? So this is like the shadow ray is typically what this is called, unsurprisingly. And the question we have to ask is does the shadow ray run into some other object? For instance, is there like a sheet in the way of the uh, sphere that's preventing it from receiving the light? Now, if I draw the scene the way that I've drawn for you on the slide, it feels like, no, there's, there's nothing in the way. But if we do a little bit of debugging, what we'll see is that in these, these dark pixels, essentially the shadow code is getting uh, triggered. So if we step back a little bit, we can say, well, what can cast a shadow in this scene? In fact, the scene that I've drawn for you on the left, it just contains a sphere and nothing else. So there are not too many candidates. And in fact, this is the phenomenon known as self shadowing, which is to say, well, when I launch the ray from the surface outward, maybe due to numerical artifacts, my ray actually ended up displaced a tiny bit into the interior of the surface. Well, if that happens, well, now I send out a ray and oops, it bumps right back into the sphere, like a minuscule micrometer away uh, from the source point. So hopefully you guys see what's going on here. Essentially, self shadowing is this kind of funny bug that happens a lot in ray tracing where I send out a secondary ray and the first thing that it runs into is just the surface that it started on. Um, there are many ways to combat this issue. So for example, you could try to work through a bunch of crazy cases like, you know, maybe when I send out a ray, I also give a list of surfaces to ignore. Um, that could be dangerous. So for example, uh, maybe I have a C-shaped surface like this and a, a ray of light bounces off the surface. 
it could be that genuinely the next thing it runs into is the same surface. Um, but instead, uh, a typical thing to do is to hack our code a little bit. Uh, in particular, rather than launching the shadow ray right on the surface at the hit point, we're going to launch it slightly displaced uh, in the direction of the shadow ray. And so that's this, uh, this epsilon idea. There are two ways to implement this in code. You could either make the uh, source point of the shadow ray displaced along its direction a tiny bit, or another way that you could do it, I think this is probably better from a coding perspective, is in your, your intersection code. I mean, typically we think of intersection as the first T bigger than zero that runs into an object. Instead, you might ask for the first T bigger than some small number epsilon that runs into an object, just because we know that the self-shadowing artifact happens right when, when T equals zero, at least in principle. Now, of course, when you start building in these like fudge factors, like this epsilon here, you can run into some trouble. I mean, it could be that your surface has an extremely thin uh, feature somewhere that's getting in the way. But for now, I think it's pretty atypical uh, to observe a scene like that in practice. And maybe you give the artist control over that fudge factor if you think it's necessary. So one question you might ask is whether we can make this shadow ray formula any more efficient. Of course, the answer is yes. In fact, we'll talk quite a bit in this class about ways to make ray tracing faster. Uh, but here's one simple observation that can help. So in principle, when we think about shadowing, we think, well, the object that's really casting the shadow is the very first one in between the, uh, if you trace from the light to the hit point. So for example, this triangle shape here is really the reason why the point P should not be lit. That said, let's say that I make my, my shadow ray from P toward the light source, and the first thing that I find is this other intersection point down here. Well, even if it turns out there's another intersection point closer to the light source or something like that, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Hopefully you guys see that, that any object obscuring the light is enough to tell us that we should not call our shad shading code. And so one very easy way to make your shadow ray code a bit faster is to say the first time you find any evidence that you're not going to receive light, just stop. Don't do any more uh, shadow ray tracing. So that's to say that I don't need to find the closest intersection either to P or to the light source. Any intersection provides us with evidence that there's a shadow, and then we can just stop our for loop. In practice, this can make things a lot faster because ray object intersection is not necessarily the fastest piece of code. And moreover, there may be more or many objects inside of your scene. So uh, a typical thing to do, and I believe in our assignment, this is what we'll have you do, is to write a special routine um, for intersecting shadow rays. It's kind of like a stripped down version of the uh, ray scene intersection that doesn't find the closest one. It just finds the uh, intersection, any intersection that's in between you and the light and then stops. Gives it a Boolean value rather than a T. And so with this, uh, code um, now we uh, know how to uh, implement at the very least uh, the uh, example on the left hand side right this is a reflective sphere and now um, or actually that's not even right I'm sorry <laughs> we've only been talking about shadows so so far in our example we know how to get these effects here but our next part of lecture is going to tell us how to get reflection and refraction and what we'll see is that those are basically similar effects. So what's the 20 miles away takeaway from the shadow code is that what we're going to do is send a ray from our eye into the scene. We get some point here. We trace it back to the light. And if there's something in the way, <laughs> then we have a shadow. But the even farther away perspective is that Ray scene intersection is really useful, right? We basically just reused the same code to cast shadows that we use to figure out what object we see from our eye. Now we're going to do the same thing to capture these two effects, reflection and refraction, but essentially just launching secondary rays in different directions. So let's do that. Let's talk about reflection. 
So I think many of us have intuition for how mirror reflection works. Essentially, what we're going to do is to cast a ray that is symmetric to the incoming ray with respect to the normal. Now, one typical thing to do, uh, just because surfaces are not perfectly reflective, they may have interesting material, is we'll cast that secondary ray. This time we need the color. This is what's different from shadow rays. But maybe we have like a pinkish surface or something. It's not just a totally perfectly polished mirror. Um, so we might accompany the surface with a reflection coefficient that takes the color of the reflected ray and then scales it by k sub s. Now, we haven't really talked about models for materials yet in this course, so this is just a very simplistic uh, one for now, and we'll return to more realistic considerations later. And moreover, we're going to need that same epsilon trick that we already discussed, or else you'll get a self-shadowed reflective sphere like what you see on the upper right. So our next goal here is to fill in a bit of detail so that you guys can actually implement mirror reflection at home. So here's how we can do it, at least for a perfect mirror. So the basic observation about mirror reflection, I'm not a physicist, by the way, so we're going to kind of do this phenomenologically, which again, it's good enough for graphics because we're not necessarily worried about physical accuracy. The basic observation is that the key vector that we're going to need for reflection is the normal vector to the surface. And that if we look at a particular plane, we'll see that there's a nice symmetry relationship. And that is the plane that's spanned by the view vector and the normal vector. Right? So that's V and N. V stands for view and N stands for normal. So if I have two vectors, they span a uh, plane. And in particular, this plane contains a really useful little triangle here. Right, which includes your eye, the hit point, and the normal to the surface, like the up direction. Incidentally, what is the view direction? It's just the, the vector from your eye to the hit point. So in the uh, law of reflection, essentially there's just a nice uh, symmetry relationship that says that, well, if I look at the theta v, this is the angle between the normal and the view direction, and I look at theta r, which is the angle between the reflected vector and the view direction, those two things should be equal, right? Theta v equals theta r. So that's our basic law of reflection. Um, of course, in our ray tracer, you know, this is a cute way to write it if you're a physicist or mathematician, but we actually have to compute the uh, reflected vector, so we need coordinates. And I've given you that expression on the slide, but let's make sure that we understand what's going on. So let me draw a uh, triangle here. So here's your view vector, and here's your normal direction. So here's N, and here's V. And the basic observation is that we can form, as always in trigonometry, a nice right triangle. And there's two components here, right? There's the parallel component to the surface. And there's the normal component, which uh, is perpendicular to the surface. And if we think about it, the parallel component actually gets left alone, right? It's just the normal component that's getting changed in the uh, reflecting uh, ray. So here's our reflective surface underneath. So remember, what can we do? We can always take a vector and write it in a basis. So here there's the normal and there's the parallel part. So in particular, what is the normal component of V? Well, If we remember our uh, linear algebra formulas, then assuming that n is a unit vector, then what happens? Well, essentially the normal component of v is just equal to the dot product of v and n, right? That's the amount of v that's in the n direction, assuming that n is a unit vector. So on the slide here, we've given you a nice uh, 
expression or picture for how to derive the uh, reflection formula that we have here. Here's the picture. So here's our view vector. We're going to displace our view vector kind of underneath our reflective surface. That's what I'm showing you on the right. Now, this blue vector on the bottom right is what we need to essentially cancel out the component of V in the normal direction. So what is that? That's minus V dot N scaling the normal vector. And that's just gotten from the projection formula that we wrote down. Now, what do we do uh, to get the reflected ray? Well, we take this reflected piece and we're just basically flipping its sign. Another way to understand that is that we add a second multiple of exactly the same vector to the view direction. And that is what leads us to our reflection formula shown on the slide here, that R is equal to V minus two V dot N times the normal vector. All this is saying is that I take the, oops, I can't circle stuff. I take the normal component, I cancel it out, and then I negate it. And that's how I get that factor of two. So this is just a way to start with the incoming view vector and get back the reflected ray. Um, at the end of the day, in your ray tracer, this is quite easy to implement, right? So what, what do you do? You have your view vector because that's what came in from your eyeball to the reflective surface. You have the normal to the surface. We've already talked about how to compute that in the previous lectures. And now you just basically type this formula in to get the direction of your secondary ray. That's R. What's the source point of the secondary ray? Well, it's just right here. It's the hit point. Okay. So uh, this is what you need to create these really perfectly reflective surfaces like what I show you on the bottom right. Of course, this is super realistic and there's a number of reasons for that, right? This material is perfectly reflective. Um, there's nothing else interesting going on with it. And moreover, it neglects some really important physical effects. So one of the physical effects that is a bit tricky to capture, but not impossible, is that the amount of reflection actually depends on the uh, angle. So the sort of hack that I've already given you all essentially just uses a constant, right? It says that K sub uh, uh, S here is really just the coefficient that we're going to use to take that reflected ray and then scale its color when I'm sending it back to my eye. But that's not really how physics works. There's not just like some magic constant that tells you what to do. Um, the more realistic model is actually that the amount of reflection depends on the angle at which the reflection is happening. So in particular, there's something uh, that I think was originally noticed by Fresnel, which is that there's more reflection happening when you have a grazing angle. That is to say that if I look at a reflected ray, so here's my eye again, it hits the surface and then it bounces off. If this angle is small, then there might be more reflection than a ray that goes directly orthogonal to the surface or close to it and then back off. So this is more, this is less. You can kind of see that in this photograph here, um, that the rays that are bouncing off of the surface toward your eye uh, at like kind of a small angle uh, are getting reflected more. Okay, so uh, there are many different ways to capture this effect, right? One way to do it is to make K sub S essentially just a function of the angle that you're bouncing. Um, it was a very fancy formula from, from Fresnel, uh, but Schlick uh, introduced this really, <laughs> a pretty Schlick approximation, if I do say so, uh, which as far as I know is basically just guessed. Like, I don't think that there's too many physical principles that went into it, but I could be wrong, um, which is this funny formula here. Uh, and it turns out that this fits uh, the real effect pretty well. So essentially what you do is you compute cosine of the uh, reflection angle. And just by plugging into this uh, function here, um, one minus cosine to the fifth, you get a pretty reasonable um, formula for how much of the ray uh, color I should reflect back toward the next location.
Of course, in reality, all of this depends on the material and other parameters that we haven't really discussed yet, but this is just an easy to implement formula that captures some of this nice effect. And so at the end of the day, it allows you to render all kinds of funny images like this funny uh, sphere flake uh, fractal here. Notice that this is a great test for ray tracing where we're going to talk about recursive ray tracing later in this lecture, but essentially you can see that rays aren't just hitting the surface once, bouncing for reflection and then getting rendered. They're like bouncing all over the place between all these different sphere objects before they hit the light or your eye. Okay, so that's reflection. Now typically in a ray tracing lecture, we always pair reflection with a second effect called refraction. And this is essentially the effect that governs things like windows and other transparent surfaces that are made of different materials than the air. So let's talk about the refraction effect. Well, at a uh, 90 miles away perspective, refraction is very similar to reflection when it comes to how you implement it in a ray tracer. Essentially, all we need to do is rather than compute the reflected direction, we need to compute the refracted direction. And then we're going to have yet another constant, which is physically unrealistic but useful in ray tracing, um, which is the transparency coefficient, um, which is essentially telling us how much we should use that refraction term. So essentially the way to think about KT is if I have a very opaque window, you know, so there's like cloudy or something, then I still want to do this refraction computation, right? Like there may be a ray that goes secondarily through the surface, but the like nice bright blue of the surface might get attenuated before it gets back to my eye because of the refraction effect. Now, of course, as with many things in this lecture, this is a really poor approximation. Um, so for example, maybe I want to account for the length of that line segment, like the farther the light travels through my cloudy surface, the uh, more attenuated it gets. And these are types of effects that we'll begin to talk about as we move on to more advanced rendering topics in this course. But for now, there's just some magic uh, constant that is the uh, refraction uh, coefficient that's going to attenuate the refracted ray. Incidentally, it's very typical to combine the different effects that we've talked about so far. Uh, in particular, um, a very simple shading model will contain at least three terms, right? One is direct lighting. So in your direct lighting, you've got to account for the shadow rays. That was the first thing we talked about. There might be a reflective term and a refractive term. So for instance, maybe I render a window and the window obviously has a pretty serious amount of refraction. But of course, windows also are reflective surfaces too. So we may actually launch two rays, one that refracts, one that reflects with their own uh, constants and then sum together the result. And moreover, maybe the window has a little bit of grease on the surface that actually adds a uh, diffuse component as well. So it's perfectly fine to add these effects together. Each one will just launch its own secondary ray. So qualitatively, what's going on when we talk about refraction? Well, there are many different ways to talk about it, but I think many of us are familiar with this optical effect where objects look like they're in different locations when we view them through water, right? So here, um, if we were to cast a ray from the eye directly toward where we're seeing the fish, we actually would see a slight ghost of a fish that's displaced from reality. And the reason is that when the ray leaves your eye and hits the surface of the water, it actually gets redirected a little bit. Of course, this is already a practical takeaway of 6837, which is that if you're going to uh, harpoon a fish from outside of the water, if you direct your spear directly at the fish as you see it, you're actually likely to miss. Um, my understanding is that that makes spear fishing hard, but I can't say that I've ever done it myself. So what do we need to do? Well, if we uh, want to be more effective uh, hunting fishermen, or if we want to have a ray tracer that accounts for refraction, uh, we need to work out exactly what this angle is and how it redirects rays. So let's do that now. So here's how refraction works. And this was originally a uh, law that I think was noticed first by Snell and later by Descartes, or maybe it was in the opposite order. 
I'm not a uh, historian, but uh, these equations may look pretty familiar. So, uh, right. In fact, I think it depends on the country that you're from, uh, whether or not you learned this as the Snell law or Descartes law. Um, as far as I know here in America, it's Snell's law. In any event, Snell's law governs the, there's essentially a relationship between two different angles. There are essentially two different rays that we need to worry about here. There's the incident ray, and then there's the refracted ray. And so in particular, we can look at the angle of the incident ray to the normal, that's theta i, and the angle of the refracted ray to the normal, which we're gonna call theta t. So what Snell or Descartes or who knows, probably some other person that isn't getting any credit, you know, hundreds of years later, um, what their law tells us is that there's a really nice relationship between these different angles that's given on the lower left of our slide here. So the basic point is that the cause of refraction is the fact that light is passing from one material into another. Actually, the speed of light gets attenuated a little bit depending on uh, what material the light is moving through. And so the effect of refraction is essentially having to do with these changes. And in particular, what Snell and Descartes and, and probably others notice is that we can associate to every material a different constant, which we're gonna call the index of refraction. This is typically notated using a Greek character. This is eta. And so here, there are two different materials involved. Material one, which is the incoming material, has index of refraction eta i. Material two has index of refraction eta t. And these are just things that the artist or maybe the engineer setting up the scene is going to set manually, right? This is a physical property of your material rather than like a piece of code or something like that. So what Snell and Descartes tell us is that the relationship between the incoming angle and the outgoing angle essentially looks like a ratio of sines. So in particular, eta i times sine of the incoming theta i is equal to eta t times sine of the outgoing theta t. I've written it in a different way on the slide on the very bottom here, which is to say I can look at the ratio of the two sines, and that is exactly the same as the ratio of the incoming and the outgoing uh, indices of refraction. So sometimes we give this object its own name, eta r, which is the relative index of refraction, just given by the ratio of these two values. Okay. So now let's work out how to actually get the refracted ray. This is a bit of a headache uh, mathematically, so luckily for you guys, I actually have some notes for once. So here's how we're gonna do it. So we're gonna do a bunch of trigonometry and vector calculus, or not even calculus, just linear algebra, I guess, uh, to get to an expression uh, that you can type into your computer. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that the aesthetic here is a bit different than what it might be in your physics class. Uh, in particular, we really need the x, y, and z components of the refracted vector. We really need to operate in coordinates. Um, physicists probably stop at the Snell-Descartes law and just say, well, that's really the interesting physical law. That's absolutely right, but, but we really need to figure out how to compute t in closed form so that we can code it into our ray tracer. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that. I'm going to set my tablet flat here so that I can write on it. Okay. So we're going to write lots of different vectors and then start factoring our code, uh, or rather our expression. Um, first of all, just for convenience, we're going to define a vector i. Notice when we talked about reflection, we used v, and v was pointing from the, uh, the viewer into the hit point. i is going to be just the negative version of that. So essentially, it's going to point from the hit point toward your viewer. That's obviously no problem mathematically or coding wise. It's just something to keep in mind um, because indeed my notation is ever so slightly inconsistent here. Okay, so let's use a little bit of trigonometry here uh, to write a nice expression. So we're gonna define a few different vectors. We have the incoming ray, which is pointing toward the uh, eyeball. 
and we have the normal uh, vector. The, the, and those are essentially the only two vectors that we have access to. Now, in addition to that, I'm going to define a third vector m. And m is kind of like a tangent to the surface here. Uh, now, one thing we're going to do is we're going to make use of m. m is orthogonal to n, but in the plane spanned by n and i. I'll let you cook through that one for a minute. Um, we're going to introduce m during our calculations, but eventually eliminate it again. So not to worry, you won't actually have to compute m. It just kind of exists on this diagram as a thing that's perpendicular to n. If you wanted to compute m, by the way, it wouldn't be a big deal. You just get it with a cross product. OK, so let's use a little bit of trigonometry. In particular, we can take i, and we can write it as the sum of its component in the n direction and its component in the m direction. So first, what is the component in the n direction? Well, notice we've labeled this theta i here. So if i points this way, n points up, there's a right triangle here. So the height of this triangle is just cosine. So what do we get? We get n cosine theta I. I'm not going to draw the little vector signs over every character. Hopefully that's okay. And we'll see that in the PowerPoint version of this slide, it's uh, bolded. Okay, but we also need to take care of the opposite component. And what can we see? Well, sine of theta I is going to be the length of the uh, right triangle opposite theta I. But we need a minus sign in front of it. Uh, because this vector is pointing to the left. So it looks like this. Okay, so all this expression is doing is taking the incoming vector i and writing it in components in the n direction and the m direction, where m is basically just a basis vector orthogonal to n. In fact, because we don't really know m, right, we only know i and n, Let's go ahead and solve for it here. In particular, if we isolate this m on the uh, right-hand side, what we get is that m is equal to what? n, ah, I don't know why that happens. n cosine theta i minus i, all of that divided by sine theta. So all I did to get from the first expression to the second is algebra. That's, that's all, just some reshuffling. Okay, so at the end of the day, our goal is to compute t, right? That's the refracted ray direction. And so now we're just going to do a bunch of math to isolate and then compute that particular vector. Okay, so the first thing we'll do, just like we did to start out, is to write t in its different components by drawing this right triangle here. Okay, so again, sine of theta t is gonna give us the opposite component. Cosine of theta t will give us the parallel component. So what do we know? We know that t is equal to minus n cosine theta t. Notice that the minus is because now we're kind of pointing into the refracted uh, material. And we're going to add to that the component that's opposite. So that's going to look like sine of theta t. And now that's in the plus m direction. So far, so good, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right. So now we have an expression for m right here. So let's plug it in. So what are we going to get? Well, the first term remains the same. So we'll still have minus n cosine theta t. But now we have an expression for m. So let's write it down. So we have uh, n cosine of theta i minus i, all of that divided by sine theta i. And we don't want to forget there is still this other term here. So that's sine theta t. OK, so all we did to get from the previous line to the current one is plug in our expression for m. Uh, 
Now what? Well, we've got all these cosines and sines floating around, and that's kind of nice for understanding the laws of physics, but it's not so nice for our computation. So our main goal is to get rid of all of those. Um, in order to do that, we can sim simplify and substitute in as many physical constants and vectors as we can. So for example, notice that we have sine of theta t and sine of theta i hiding here. And what are these values? Well, remember that we actually know what their ratio is. It's the relative index of refraction. Yeah. So we can eliminate those two terms and instead plug in a to r. And that's just a physical constant associated with our system. So that's perfectly fine from a computational perspective. So our first term still remains the same, sadly, but now we're starting to have a nicer looking expression, right? We have n cosine theta i minus i just multiplied by the relative index of refraction. By the way, if you can't read my handwriting, it's going to be okay. On the next slide, we have a nice PowerPoint version of the same expression. Okay, so now uh, with this expression, notice that n, the normal vector, appears twice. So our next trick is going to be to factor out n. Okay, so when we do that, there's a minus uh, cosine of theta t. There's a plus cosine of theta i scaled by eta r. Yeah, so in particular, we'll get um, eta r times uh, cosine theta i. Right, that's what comes out of this term. And we'll have minus cosine theta t. That's what comes out of this term. And all of that is scaling the unit normal direction. And now we still, we can't forget about our very last term here. So we'll just leave it on its own. In particular, that's minus eta r times i. Now, remember our goal. We want a computable expression, right? We just want to write a piece of code that computes the refracted ray direction. So what's computable and what's not? Well. We know i, so we're like kind of okay with having an i floating around in our expression. We can leave that term alone. But in the first term, we have these cosines, and these seem kind of annoying. <laughs> uh, we, we can probably obtain some of them with dot products, but the cosine of theta t, that one we don't know, right? Because theta t involves that refracted direction, which is exactly what we're trying to obtain. Now, our thetas are small. They're between 0 and 90 degrees, or probably minus 90 and 90 degrees. Uh, so in particular, the cosine of our angles is going to be positive. In fact, if you look at our physics diagram up here, you can easily convince yourself that if cosine is negative, something serious went wrong. We'll actually return to that in a bit. So we're going to make use of a useful trigonometric identity. Um, which is true actually for any theta, um, but then we're going to simplify it in a way that assumes cosine is uh, uh, positive. In particular, what we'll have is that cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta equals 1. Right? And this is true for all theta. If you don't remember that, you might want to revisit your trigonometry class if it's been a while. So in particular, uh, for small theta... Um, one thing that we can write is that cosine theta, really it's its absolute value, I guess, um, is equal to the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta. Okay, so let's plug that in here. Again, we're going to assume small enough theta that we don't need that absolute value. Uh, so in particular, we'll have eta r cosine theta i, but now instead of cosine, we'll have square root of 1 minus sine squared theta t and minus eta r times i. Now, why did I do that? Like somehow it seems like I'm just taking an expression and making it more complicated, and indeed that is the case. Um, but remember that essentially we need to eliminate theta t because we don't know it, right? We only know theta i because that has to do with the incoming ray. 
theta t is uh, associated to the outgoing ray, which is not something we know how to work with. So why is replacing sine um, for cosine useful? Well, Snell's law tells us what to do with sines. It's just cosines that we don't know how to cope with. So indeed, using Snell's law once again, we can say, well, this is eta r cosine of theta i. But now, uh, instead of sine squared of theta t, we can say, well, that is the same as 1 minus eta r squared sine squared of theta i. And that is just using Snell's law again. Yeah, sneaky, huh? <laughs> so that is scaled by n again, minus eta r times i. Okay, and now we're pretty much done. So this uh, sine squared is the same as 1 minus cosine squared theta i. Right, this is just using the same identity that we already used at the top of the slide. And what is cosine of theta i squared? Well, that is the same as n dot i squared. Whew. So what did we just do? Why, why did we just do all these computations? Well, take a look at our final expression. Well, we have, and that's n dot i. Essentially, what we ended up with, that very last line, is an expression for the refracted ray direction t that only involves data that we actually know. Do you see that? It only involves the vector n, the vector i, and the relative index of refraction. So this final formula here is something that we can just type into the computer and will give us the refracted ray direction in terms of the input. So by the magic of PowerPoint, here's a better typeset version of the previous slide. And essentially the only formula that we need to worry about is this very last one which gives us t in terms of the data that we know from our ray tracer. Now, as one sanity check, one thing you might notice is that there's a square root here, and you might get nervous that I'm taking the square root of a number that I have not convinced myself is positive. And indeed, that can be the case. And that actually corresponds to a physical effect. So in that case, essentially, refraction doesn't happen and instead the ray will get reflected. And this is a phenomenon known as total internal reflection. Um, so this is also useful, I believe, in fiber optic cables where they have some fiber optic material and actually the uh, ray will bounce down the interior of this cable even if it kind of looks clear from the outside. Um, so here is an example of total internal reflection. Uh, sadly, oftentimes we would demo this in class, but today uh, we can't because we're digital and my equipment is at MIT. But in any event, there's a nice experiment where you can take just a light bulb and you can rotate its position uh, as an incoming ray into this piece of material here. And what you'll end up seeing is that eventually, you know, for, for some input angles, it'll refract and then you'll reach some angle that's small enough, then suddenly the material will start to reflect instead, which is pretty cool. So a few more details that are worth uh, mentioning. Um, one is that you really need to keep track of whether you're entering or leaving a transmissive material. Um, essentially, this is gonna determine whether you work with eta r or one over eta r. Um, so this is a pretty typical uh, bug. Um, which is to say that these two cases I've shown you on the screen, one is where you're like going from the air into a piece of glass and one is going from the piece of glass outward. These are two different cases. So for instance, you may need to associate to array the current index of uh, a refraction. And one note is that one annoying case that can happen not in the physical world, but in the ray trace world, that an artist got lazy and two surfaces interpenetrate a little bit that obviously can't happen physically, but if it happens in your ray tracer, it can create a big headache here because it's, at that point, it's really not clear what the material should be uh, and, and computing the relative indices of refraction becomes non-trivial to say the least. So in this class, we won't ask you to trace rays through intersecting transparent objects, largely because that doesn't make sense physically anyway. Um, but of course, if you write an industrial ray tracer, we'll have to take care of that effect.
And by rendering with refraction and some of these other effects, uh, you get really convincing objects. So for example, uh, in this video here, we have a simulated fluid and it's being rendered uh, using three different indices of refraction, right? In this case, there's the glass, the water, and also just the air around it. Now, there are many different interpretations of the law of refraction. Um, another one that comes from variational physics uh, is that, you know, essentially, here's a sort of physical analogy. So uh, here we have our, uh, my, my graphics colleague, uh, Fredo Durand, and maybe he, you know, is in trouble in the water and, you know, the lifeguard has to run out and get Fredo. It's easier to run on sand than it is to swim through water, at least for me. I don't really look like the people in the Baywatch image here, but that's okay. Um, so it actually may make sense not to run in a straight line to Fredo, but actually to spend more distance running on the sand than running toward, than swimming toward the person in trouble. Uh, and essentially, one thing that you can convince yourself is that refracted light is making a similar calculation. Essentially, um, the speed of light is different in different materials. Uh, and one way to interpret Snell's law is that it's actually trying to take shortest paths, but just accounting for those different speeds. So let's think about some more physical phenomena that are sort of related to this. Another one is rainbows. Um, so rainbows actually are associated to refraction effects, but notice that we haven't really talked about color yet in this course. So a similar effect, uh, that is important to capture in a ray tracer, uh, at least one that is pretty popular among uh, uh, students who implement, is the uh, Pink Floyd album here, um, where essentially you see a rainbow uh, coming out of a prism. So what's going on here is that the index of refraction really is wavelength dependent, right? So different colors of light refract uh, differently. In particular, violet and blue often bend more than orange and red. This is a really difficult effect to get right in a ray tracer because often we want to do our calculations in RGB, like red, green, blue, but that has more to do with your human eye system than how light works. We'll talk about that later in this course. But to do this style of rainbow refraction really requires handling the full spectrum of visible light. Um, so this is an effect that's often ignored in graphics. There are people that work on this thing. Um, Oftentimes, they're kind of hacky ways to deal with it. Or you could try to do a wavelength-dependent ray tracer, but of course, that's quite challenging. So what goes on in a rainbow? Well, a rainbow actually is a nice composition of all the different effects we've talked about so far. So what goes on here is that there's a light source that enters a tiny droplet of water. It refracts on the outer surface of the droplet. And then total internal reflection happens on the opposite surface and it comes back out. And essentially what's going on in a rainbow is that because refraction is wavelength dependent, um, the angle that the ray comes out in depends on the wavelength and separates out these different colors of light. And so that's why we're seeing this nice rainbow effect, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so anyway, this is a great example of a physical phenomenon that's really hard to get right. In fact, I think probably a lot of rainbows you see in rendered images are basically just billboards that are superimposed on top of the uh, rendering. Um, in any event, uh, although this is a nice effect, it's certainly outside of the scope of our course to get right. But you can do it. Um, so for example, here is a photon mapping uh, algorithm. We'll talk a little bit more about photon mapping in the lecture on global illumination. And if you look really carefully underneath uh, this material here, you'll see that there is a wavelength dependent uh, uh, reflection going on. Now, there's so many different applications of the machinery we've talked about. You know, ray tracing is this fabulous tool uh, for simulating light. You know, in our context, we've introduced it for rendering, um, but the ray tracing algorithm has actually created a lot of revolutions, not just in how we draw pictures on the computer, but also how we do some other calculations. Um, so for example, one of the really challenging things to do <laughs> 100 years ago that we can now do in an extremely precise way is to design lenses, for example, for your camera. Uh, 
the, probably the lens inside of your, your camera phone or whatever your favorite device is, was really carefully designed to have different effects. Like for instance, you know, to capture a particular field of view or to um, bend light in a way that maybe gets a fisheye effect or what have you. Uh, so camera uh, lenses are quite hard to design. There's the ideal pinhole camera that we talked about in class, but in reality, um, there's aberration and, and the fact that your lens is this positively sized object uh, intended to focus light on a sensor inside of your camera. Um, so essentially what goes on uh, in lens design is just the ray tracing algorithm combined with these reflection and refraction rules that we've talked about in class uh, today. And so what this allows us to do is to predict how your camera behaves before you actually manufacture the lens, which is pretty cool. So now there's software like uh, ZMAX, which essentially allows uh, engineers to design lenses really carefully to get particular properties, whether it's resolution or what have you. If you like this kind of stuff, you should look into MIT's course 6815 um, or computational photography, which I believe covers this in some level of detail. Uh, there are similar applications all over the place. So one kind of fun one in, in my research area, which is optimal transport, uh, actually involves designing uh, refractive surfaces. Um, so in particular, uh, let's take a look at a part of this video if it'll load on my computer. Oh no. So this is on design of caustics. So the idea here is to actually leverage the uh, refractive effects on your surface and the caustics, which are kind of focusing the light. We'll talk more about that in a future application. Um, but rather than to just let them happen by accident, instead, we're going to design them. So let's fast forward to some cool results. So for example, here is a uh, glass surface. And the surface has been, well, I don't know if it's glass or not, but a, a transparent surface. And the surface has been optimized so that when you view it with a particular lighting configuration, it actually shows an image on the wall just by focusing the light. And you could predict that by doing things like ray tracing and global illumination. Let's see some other uh, results here. So my laptop is kind of choking playing this video, but I'll let you watch it at home. Okay, of course we should pause for a moment here and know that essentially at the end of today's lecture, or at least at the point that we're at so far, we can render images like what you see on the slide here. But these images aren't terribly realistic. They look like some weird 1980s universe where uh, we only have spheres and checkerboards, uh, and all of them are perfectly reflective or diffusive. The reality is that no surface is a perfect mirror, no material interface is perfectly smooth, and so a very typical thing we need to do is to model roughness and other phenomena. In particular, essentially what went wrong here is that the code that we've been discussing so far essentially has this ratio of one ray in to one way ray out, similarly for uh, refraction. But the reality is that surfaces are at a micro scale kind of bumpy. <laughs> and essentially what that bumpiness does is changes the direction of the secondary ray. And so in non-ideal of reflection and refraction, you might have one ray in, right from the light bulb, notice it's not your eye, but many different rays out. And essentially, that's what we need to model. We haven't really captured in this course. So here's a nice example. Essentially, by having non-ideal reflection and refraction, you can end up with glossy materials as opposed to just mirror reflection. Um, and uh, even glossy refraction where, sure, we can see through the surface to the plane underneath it, but only in kind of a fuzzy way. So let's pause for a second. How could we capture this effect in a ray tracer? Well, the basic point is that, again, the one thing our ray tracer is really good at is taking a ray and telling you what thing it runs into. <laughs> and we can keep calling that piece of code over and over and over again. We don't need to do it just once per pixel. So in particular, let's think about reflection. 
So here's the reflection code we've worked out so far, right? We have an eye, it points to a surface, it hits at a particular angle theta, and it comes out at the same angle theta. And that's what's creating these sort of real, really shiny reflective surfaces that look like they've been brushed to death. Um, they're not brushed, but maybe polished to death. But the reality is that we want more of a glossy effect where this outgoing ray Maybe it came from a few different sources. So that's really easy to capture in ray tracing. Essentially, all you have to do is compute the reflected ray direction, but maybe add a bit of a random perturbation to it uh, and then average over a few trials. So in particular, the ray comes in from your eye to the surface. And now, rather than just computing one color of the perfectly reflected ray, we're going to randomly perturb its direction a bit, compute that color, and maybe we do it 10 or 100 times and average the result. And that's what will create this nice glossy surface here. So again, all we're doing is just launching more than one secondary reflected ray, where you have the ideal reflected ray plus some amount of noise in the direction to account for the glossiness of the surface, which is just kind of like a shake, shaky normal vector. Now, when we do that, we probably don't want to do it just one time, like reflect the ray, perturb its direction a bit, and keep moving. Um, because if we do, then we'll see a lot of noise on the surface. So instead, we compute many different reflected rays, each one slightly perturbed from the last, and then average the result. And this is possible because, again, our ray tracer is just this giant abstraction for intersecting rays with stuff and then computing their colors. Here's a similar effect that can happen, which is a shadow. So, so far we've assumed that a light source has a location, like a point in space. But the reality of light sources, for example, you, you know, big fluorescent light bulbs, is that they take up a positive amount of area, right? So remember in our, our lighting calculation, we did a kind of funny thing, which was, I said, okay, now draw a vector toward the light. <laughs> That makes sense if your light is like this itty bitty little light bulb, but what happens if your light is actually, you know, a rectangle worth of light source? Well, in that case, uh, probably your shadow isn't gonna look like this weird hard curve that we've seen in our result uh, so far, but rather something fuzzier, right? That is to say, the amount of obstruction of that square depends on where you are. So the reality of shadows is that it looks something more like what I've shown you on the uh, slide here. You know, you might have soft shadow effects. This is often called soft. Um, or you could even have a frosted bulb, bulb, which is redirecting the light in directions that aren't just directly out of the light source, even if it is basically a point. So what are we to do? Well, our solution and ray tracing problems is pretty much always the same, which is to say, launch more rays. So how did we do shadowing so far? Well, we just did one shadow ray to determine whether or not you're in the light source. Instead, if we do shadow rays, well, what we can do is say, okay, well now our light source takes up a positive amount of area. When I generate my shadow ray, I am going to randomly draw a point on my light source and do my shadowing computation. But there's a problem, which is that, of course, if I randomly draw it for each different point in the, uh, penum the penumbra here, uh, then I'll get noise. That's what we see on the top here. So instead, I'm gonna launch multiple shadow rays and essentially just collect the fraction of them that make it back to the light source. So this is like Monte Carlo integration. In fact, it's exactly what it is where essentially I'm going to keep drawing different shadow rays whose direction is ever so slightly different, right? Essentially each direction has to do with a different location on the light source. And I'm going to average the result to figure out what fraction of the light source is actually reaching the surface. Now, what's the problem? Uh, the more effects that we add of this nature, right? Like glossy surfaces and shadow rays, they're super easy to add to your ray tracer, right? It's just like adding a for loop and a random number generator outside of the shadowing code you already have. And I strongly encourage you to give this a try on your assignments. But the more shadow rays you add, the more ray scene intersections you have to do, 
and the slower your ray tracer gets. So if we want a really high quality soft shadow, like what you see here, we're going to pay for it in computation. Okay, so here's another, uh, yet another example where essentially if I add more rays to my ray tracer, I can make the image better, but at the cost of uh, more rays. Uh, so one thing that we haven't talked about yet in this course is if you zoom into this low resolution image, the sharp edges have this kind of weird staircasing artifact. This is sometimes known as the jaggies. <laughs> So the basic point of the jaggies is that in our rendered image so far, we're thinking of the image like a grid and we're sending a ray down the center of each of our grid cells. But what if I'm trying to draw something like a sphere? There it is. So for example, consider this pixel in the, on the uh, middle right. So here, the ray that went right down the middle just barely missed that sphere. So the color that I got was the white background. But the reality is that this pixel does overlap with the sphere a little bit. So a more realistic color might be partially the background and partially the color of the sphere. This idea is called anti-aliasing. We're gonna talk about the math of anti-aliasing later, but addressing it in a ray tracer is pretty straightforward. As with just about everything else that we've talked about today, the solution is more rays. So in particular, here's a single pixel. So far, we've just generated one ray right down the middle. A very simple anti-aliasing technique might be to compute the color of several rays inside of the pixel, and then to average their color rather than um, just one. Oops. That's not great. So that's how we can solve this problem. If we want to uh, uh, anti-alias a pixel, all we have to do is generate more than one ray through the pixel and average the result of computing its color. Let's talk about even more effects that essentially need more rays. So in particular, what if we want to do motion blur? Well, what is motion blur? Um, in some sense, what you're seeing in a single static image is the result of multiple points in time. So in uh, this motion blur effect, one way that we can capture it might be to send multiple rays, but this time you randomly perturb the position of the object that you're trying to render in the motion blur effect. So this is kind of like simulating the fact that when you use a real camera, open up the shutter, you collect light for a positive amount of time, and then you close it. And so for example, with these billiard balls, they're moving while the shutter is open, and that's what's causing the motion blur effect. Or here's another one that needs more rays. This is called the depth of field effect, where things are out of focus. The idea here is to model uh, the aberration of your, your lens or the, the, the aperture, which is positive. Uh, it's not just a single point, uh, which is what we talked about when we talked about a pinhole camera. And so what can we do here? Well, once again, we can sample multiple rays per pixel, per pixel um, which is trying to simulate this uh, close or far out of focus uh, style effect. So what's the point here? The point here, um, we're not going through each of these phenomena in detail and how you can ray trace them. That's something you can look up pretty easily. The point is that the more rays you send out into your scene and then average the resulting color, the more cool effects that you can get. Everything from depth of field to glossy surfaces to motion blur. But the problem and the one that we're going to address in our next lecture is computation time, right? If we think of intersecting a ray with your scene as something that takes some amount of computational effort, with each one of these effects that we add, essentially we're just blowing up the amount of time that we need to produce our ray traced image. So certainly an image with glossy materials, depth of field, soft shadows, and so on, could take quite a long time pr to produce, which is something that we're going to address uh, very soon. Okay, so to conclude our discussion today, especially because it appears that my laptop is kind of melting down, 
Uh, let's talk about recursive uh, ray tracing, which is just sort of an abstraction to think about some of the things that we've already done. So as a bit of a recap of today's lecture, notice that essentially all we did was take our ray casting code and make it a little more complicated, right? So when we trace a ray, we essentially intersect all the objects in the scene and then compute the color, both the color that's directly uh, on the surface as well as things that you get from shadowing. Um, then we launch new pieces of code to deal with reflective uh, surfaces and transparent surfaces. And notice that this is actually a recursive algorithm, right? Because what happens in the trace ray code, well, I need the color of the mirror and the transparent pieces, and those are calling the trace ray code. This is recursive. So, the question you might ask is, does this ever end? Like you could be in a scenario where there's so many different mirrors, the light is bouncing all over the place that you overload your computer. And indeed that can actually easily happen in ray tracing code. In fact, if every time you bounce, you hit a glossy surface, maybe you're not even just launching one ray, you're launching a hundred of them. And pretty soon you're gonna overload your computation. So a very typical thing to do is to essentially stop your recursion once you reach a certain depth, so for example, if I hit five different mirrors, <laughs> then I'm going to assume that because of that constant that I'm multiplying uh, by every time I reflect, the contribution is pretty much negligible. Um, or maybe I actually look at that constant and I say, okay, at this point, the amount that I could change my pixel color is so small, I'm gonna stop recursing. This is really important to build into your ray tracer or it could just grind to a halt. Um, of course, choosing the level of recursion that you're willing to put up with is a really important parameter. So for instance, here are three balls and three reflective surfaces. If I don't have any recursion allowed, then I don't see the reflection at all. With one, I see some reflection. With two, I see even more. Um, so essentially with each of these images, I get better reflective effects, but the computation time is higher I use more resources. And in each case, I've still bounded the number of times reflection. So for instance, maybe there's some ray that in reality would bounce back and forth between these two surfaces and we're not capturing that. I think in this particular image, that's not the case. So one way that we can think about that that I'm gonna leave you with for next time is to talk about an object or at least a visualization that we sometimes call the ray tree the basic idea here is that rays beget more rays in the ray tracing algorithm. So in particular, here's your eye. So let's say that your eye sends a ray out into the scene. Well, now that ray launches a, a, a few different secondary rays. So for example, there's a ray uh, toward the light bulb. Here's another ray uh, that is gotten from reflection. Well, maybe the reflection surface casts another ray uh, for lighting and shadowing. It also has another reflection ray and so on. Maybe the original surface also has some refraction going on. That has to do its own shadow ray and so on. So notice that on the right hand side here, I've been building up a tree where the root of the tree is the original ray and each node is an intersection and then the child or the children of the node are all of the new rays that it launches. Essentially, what we end up with is a really complicated number of rays in this entire structure where every ray intersects an object and then launches several more. And that's really easy to code, but this is what's adding to our computation. And so essentially, that's what we're going to worry about in this course is that the complexity of our ray tracer is extremely high uh, just to get some subtle changes to the color of a pixel. Here's another nice visualization of the ray tree. So here on the right is the incoming ray and then you can see it getting reflected and refracted in all kinds of different ways uh, and those are colored uh, in the different uh, fashions. So notice that this single incoming white ray, which is just used to maybe color one pixel, <laughs> is actually beginning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, three, four, like 
on the order of 20 <laughs> uh, different rays that it needs just to do one color computation. And that's where the expense of ray tracing is coming from. So in our next lecture, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to reduce this computation and make single ray scene intersection faster. So as a quick overview of today's lecture, we've essentially transitioned from ray casting to ray tracing by launching secondary rays. Uh, and the particular secondary rays that we've tried to launch include shadow rays, which detect whether a light is obstructed by something in between the light and the surface that you're trying to render. Reflection rays, which bounce a ray off of a surface in a direction um, equal to but opposite, in some sense, the direction that it came in with. Refraction, where rays go through a surface, but they redirect thanks to differences in material. And then we also talked about many other effects, which essentially included glossy surfaces and so on. And to capture these effects, what we did is rather than just making a single reflected ray, for example, we launch many of them that are all randomly perturbed from one another and then average their colors. Finally, we discussed essentially the motivation for why we need to worry about the efficiency of ray tracing, which is that this recursive algorithm where one ray begets more rays can create a lot of problems. And that includes the recursive depth which we can essentially just limit in our code, say if we've bounced more than five times, stop. Um, but even just in a pretty shallow ray tracer, you can end up with many, many different rays, each of which needs to uh, intersect all the objects in our scene. So in our next lecture, we're gonna talk about how to make this procedure faster by accelerating and reducing the number of ray object intersections we have to do, and so on. So with that, I will see you guys later.